Good afternoon, everyone, on this beautiful, warm, rainy day in fall. I'm Katherine Brookman, Associate Director, Knowledge Transfer and Exchange. And on behalf of Dr. Jack Callahan, Director of the Center of Research Expertise for the Prevention of Musculoskeletal Disorders, or CREMSD as we are more commonly known, we'd like to thank you for joining us for this free webinar. We are grateful to the Ministry of Labor for our funding, which supports the delivery of these webinars and to PSHSA who work with us on the collaboration of this community of practice for client patient handling and to our presenters who provide their time and expertise. The format of today's webinar is as follows. The presentation will be given after which time there will be 10 to 15 minutes for your questions. We ask that you type your questions into the chat box and I will relay these questions or their themes should there be duplication to our presenter. Should you have a pressing question that cannot wait until the end of the presentation, such as a technology glitch, please type this into the chat box and we will do our very best to address it right away. We do record these webinars and we will be making available to you shortly after the presentation, a copy of the presentation, along with an evaluation which we encourage you to complete, as it does assist us in the future delivery and planning of our webinars. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter today, Janice Jazz Kolka. Janice is an ergonomist at Hamilton Health Sciences providing support to a community of 15,000 staff, physicians, researchers, and volunteers. Janice obtained her Honours Bachelor of Arts in Kinesiology and Physical Education degree from Wilfrid Laurier University and her Masters of Human Kinetics from the University of Windsor. She is a Canadian Certified Professional Ergonomist with 11 years experience providing a variety of ergonomics services to clients and most recently joined the Hamilton Health Sciences team in 2015. During her time with Hamilton Health Sciences, Janice has developed and implemented the organization's Safe Patient Handling Program, which has provided training to over 2,000 staff and leaders, reducing injury rates in the longest participating departments by 50%. Passion lies with supporting teams to strategically reduce musculoskeletal disorders within their work environments, improving staff safety and, in turn, patient care. We're thrilled to have Janice take us through developing a comprehensive safe patient handling program. Over to you, Janice. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for joining me today on uh, this little journey we're going to go on. So. As Catherine mentioned, um, Hamilton Health Sciences is a community of 15,000 staff, physicians, researchers, and volunteers. So it's quite a large organization. And I really wanted to give you this background to kind of show the breadth of what we're talking about because we're not only focusing on one small hospital, we're focusing on five hospitals, five specialized centers, and we also have numerous clinics and support services that we provide in the community. Our hospital system is one of the only in Ontario that does care for all ages from pre-birth to end of life. So we have a wide range of services and we are the regional centers for trauma, cardiac, stroke, etc. So to kind of get started, I have some poll questions just to see how we're gauging currently. Um, the first question is, does your organization currently have a safe patient handling program? Right, so I'm seeing the majority are saying yes, we have something or potentially not applicable. All right, great. So we'll move on to the next question now. So the next question I have is how would you best describe your program? So given the options that are provided in front of you, how would you best describe this program that you have? Thank <laughs> you. 
Is this question a little more challenging to answer, I see? All right. We'll leave it with those responses. So we'll move on now. Thank you. The reason I ask that question is a lot of times everyone thinks that a safe patient handling program is about training. And I'm here today to tell you it's not just about training. And that's why I wanted to share this experience that we've had here at Hamilton Health Sciences because we quickly learned a patient handling program focuses on much, much more than training um, to be successful. So to give you a brief overview of what I wanted to capture today for you, I've tried to break down how we launched our program in six steps. So we're going to go through each of these steps together and I'll give you a little bit of information as to what each step means and then some examples from our current program at Hamilton Health Sciences. So step one is gathering information and really this is where we all start. So what information do I need to get started with this? So really it's thinking about all the information sources you have available to you. So when we think about this, the first thing that comes to most minds is injury information. So let's look at our injury data or root cause analyses and see what's going on. So who's getting hurt? What type of transfers were they doing? Um, what injuries are occurring? So potentially the locations, departments, patient populations that we're seeing them in. How are they performing the transfer? Were they using equipment or safe work practices? These are the types of questions we want to explore when we're looking at our injury information. Literature is another great avenue to go down. Um, we could see what some of the best practices are that have been published or what the research is telling us in regards to what has worked or what hasn't. Contacting peer organizations is a place that we actually started with just to see what's out there. What are people doing that is working or isn't working or what advice can be shared? Staff focus groups are a great avenue in order to gain feedback from staff who experience this day in and day out. So taking a, that step towards that participatory approach and getting that feedback from staff is really important. Collaborating with the departments that you might be working with or stakeholders is also crucial. You want to understand how can they participate in this process to make it successful not only for what your targets are but also for their own. And then resources. What resources do you have available to you? And this could be physical resources, capital resources, manpower resources. So for what we learned, when we looked at our information, this is the story we were able to tell. We gathered information from our injury information and noticed that 50% of our lost time injuries were accounted to patient hand or were MSD related and 50% of those were related to patient handling. This was costing our organization millions of dollars. So we needed to understand, do we target the places where we're having injuries the most? And would that be more of a strategic launch for ourselves? Literature also identified to us that a comprehensive, multifactorial approach was most effective. So not only was it about that theory component, but the practical hands-on piece as well. Use of frontline staff as peer coaches also became a really important factor that we noted for sustainability. When we talked to our peer organizations, they were telling us they were looking for similar information. And really we needed to understand, should we be targeting current employees or new hires? And really that focus on the hands-on training became apparent. When we talked to staff, we noted that challenges were present with accessing equipment, storage of equipment, and their confidence in using the equipment. Leaders, educators, our MSC prevention committee, engineering teams, and biomedical technology teams were also really important to touch base with to understand what their desires were for this program, as well as how they can support. And finally, we learned from gathering information that we cannot achieve the goals that we wanted in this project without additional support. And for us, that actually meant one additional full-time employee to develop and oversee this program, funding for equipment, space for training, and then we actually looked into an RFP for an external provider for training services. We took all of this information to present to our senior leadership and we used what's called a, a logic model. So here's an example of the logic model we used. This will be in the slides that are presented to you. And you can see how we broke down our problem statement, our goal, the resources required, the activities that we wanted to provide, the deliverables at the end, and then our short-term and long-term objectives. So 
Step two is gaining organizational commitment. This is probably the greatest roadblock for most organizations. So really, how do I gain buy-in from senior leadership? For us, it really came down to understanding our organizational strategic plan. So how can you work with su supporting it or achieving a target? Do you have metrics to demonstrate your current problem and the impact you can have on that target? Can you show financial benefit? And really what it comes down to here is knowing your audience, knowing who you're talking to and who's making the decisions. You can also sell your story using legislative compliance or staff safety as a motivator. Patient care and safety is also greatly influenced, especially when you're looking from the clinical perspective. And finally, we use or, um, staff feedback or leader feedback that we collected during that information phase. So for us, this is an example of our strategic plan. And the green arrows indicate where we could have a direct impact with this program. So we knew we could directly have an impact on our lost time injuries and supporting a safe at work initiative that was launched as part of our strategic alignment. In the, in the meantime as well, we also could have an impacting approach um, or an impacting um, influence on patient experience. So if our staff are safe, our patients are more apt to be safe and have a better experience, as well as attendance management. Step three, designing your program. So what elements should you consider as part of your program? This is the bulk of what we're going to talk about today. So when you're designing your program, there's many elements you want to consider, and we want to think back to that whole multifaceted approach. So your policy and protocol is one thing, and I'm going to go into more detail about each of these elements. So you have your policy and protocol is usually a starting place for most groups. Training and educational curriculums. What are we actually going to train or provide to staff? Then there's resources and supports for staff. Patient handling needs assessment and action plan. Evaluation criteria and a sustainability plan. These last two points, I'm going to go into more detail as I've separated them out in their own steps, but these top four, I'll be going through in a little more detail now. So your policy and protocol actually demonstrates the organizational's commitment to your cause. Main objectives in your policy and protocol should outline principles and procedures for preventing these MSDs due to the patient handling activities. They should identify the roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities of all parties, and they should inform your organizational community about the requirements of your policy and protocol. So our example, our policy, we actually have a protocol, we call it. In our protocol, we have general statements. Our general statements are the key factors and the key components we train our staff in our actual curriculum, which I'll get to. So for example, our general statements allude that we do not support any manual handling of patients, manual lifting, I should clarify. We have a minimum of two staff requirement for patient handling tasks. All staff performing patient handling tasks must be trained and competent. And mobility status must be identified at the moment of transfer. We then outline roles and responsibilities for the various parties that are involved in this program and then provide definitions. We also outline many procedures. For example, we talk about mobility assessment and communication. So if a patient's mobility is assessed by either the rehab team or the nursing staff, how is that communicated to the next staff member looking after that patient at transfer of accountability? Technique use and equipment use are outlined. Education and training requirements. We go into detail about inspections of equipment and what to do if equipment is found defective or preventative maintenance. Infection control components are commented on, as well as equipment purchasing and then program evaluation and improve improvements. We've also included in our protocol various appendices. Two examples um, that I'll provide. One is our bedside mobility decision support tool. So this is what we train staff to use to perform that assessment at the bedside. So it's either for staff to confirm what the care plan has indicated or for staff who may not have a care plan for a patient, for example, in the emergency department, it's for them to make a decision about the, the safest choice to mobilize that patient. 
We also have checklists that include different um, aspects to look at when inspecting, and in this case, it's our soft equipment, our specialty equipment, so slings, slider sheets, our roll boards. We have checkpoints for staff to reference to see what they should be looking for when inspecting these prior to use. Another component to consider when developing your program is how you're actually going to deliver this training or the curriculum that is required. One of the key questions you want to ask yourself, who will the training be provided for? Are you providing it for current staff, for new staff, a specific occupation or department? What topics will be covered in training? Are you going to be looking at more theoretical approaches to this or will you be actually providing hands-on practical and what equipment will be covered? How will the training be delivered? Will it be e-learning based? Will it be hands-on? Will it be a combination? How long will the training be? This gets a little tricky depending on the availability of staff, but how long do you actually need to cover all the topics that you do want to train on? How often will your training be provided? Again, this will relate to who you're actually training. Where will you provide this training? Do you have a dedicated space? Do you have the equipment that you need to provide training to staff? And who will deliver this training? As I mentioned, we brought in an external training provider, but if this will be done by yourself, do you have the resources to do this? Right here is our training flow. So this is our curriculum and how it's outlined. And we've targeted it from two different streams, from a new employee perspective and from a current employee perspective. When we break it down for new employees and the education they receive as part of this program, all new hires that come into our organization, they review an MSD prevention video. It's very general in nature, but it's an introduction to risk factors and safe practices to reduce risk. Our health professionals go through what's called health professional orientation. For those that do perform patient handling tasks or clinical staff, they'll receive 45 minutes of theory. So it's an in-person session where they'll go through patient handling assessment, equipment inspection, and case studies. Following that, as a new employee, they receive three hours of practical hands-on experience. This is provided by one of our ergonomists, and we cover um, pivot transfers with a flat sheet technique. We cover our SARA study, a standing and raising aid, a mechanical one for had to explain that further, a floor lift, ceiling lift, roll board with a flat sheet, and maxi slide sheets. All of that content is covered in a three hour training period. For current employees, it's a little different because it's more strategic in the fact that we don't train every current employee, but we have a strategic approach to this. And I'll go in detail about that shortly. But for current employees, they can attend what's called general staff training. The curriculum is identical for new employees, but it's captured in a four hour period, which they receive the theory component in roughly a one hour, and then the same three hour practical component. For staff who wish to become patient handling coaches, they then receive an additional four hours of training. This covers two hours of theory, and then two hours of practical problem solving. And in that practical problem solving, we cover common examples and situations they experience. So we have a patient fall to the floor and how are we lifting that patient? We talk about sling insertion behind patients in chair or on the bed. And then we also talk about bariatric solutions. Those are just some general topics we cover and then staff attending those sessions can also bring their own problems that we work through as a group. We're currently working on and looking at how we can provide refresher training. And this is their, our in development uh, piece. So we're looking at annual e-learning and biannual practical refreshers and how these will be feasible within our organization. Once staff leave training, we need to ensure that they do have resources to support them as we cannot be there every single day, but we want to make sure they have something to reference. So when thinking about that, considerations are what, do, what is already in place that our staff look at or view or access for other information? So department bulletin boards, for example, staff station binders, intranet sites, contact information being available, so either for the peer coaches or for safety resources.
An example from our program, and I'll use the maxi slide sheets as an example that we use for repositioning. We provided multiple avenues or aspects of um, reference for staff. So we have tip sheets that have been made using our safe work practices that are posted either printed within the department or they are posted within um, equipment storage areas or even at the bedside pending on the need of the department. We make available all of the um, instructions for use or the user manuals for staff and these can typically be found on our intranet site. Some departments have put them in station binders. We also have videos that we created for um, specific pieces of equipment so that staff can reference these as well if they need that quick refresher and we're not able to do a hands-on in the near future. One of the most important aspects of our program, and this was actually a, a learning point for us from our pilot program, was the need for a needs assessment and development of an action plan. It's not only about training, but it's also not only about equipment. And what we understood when we did the needs assessment through some reviews of literature to see where barriers to use of equipment are and what challenges staff face and the feedback that we did receive in our focus groups, we needed to understand not only what department characteristics come to play, such as the patient populations, but also what are the department processes? How do they assign patients? What's mobility communication like? How are they tracking any of this information for staff to find? Injury investigations. How are injuries investigated? How do we know we're eliminating risk factors as opposed to just fighting fires? What controls are implemented? What policies do they review or have communicated with staff? Equipment. When it comes to equipment, we're looking at, is it labeled? How is the laundry process working? How are they procuring equipment? Do they have storage for it? And how available is it to staff? And then space restrictions. Many of us that are working in hospitals know that there is no space. <laughs> um, so we're limited to where we can store equipment, and this does become a barrier for use. So we review what options are available for that. Moving on to step four, how do we implement our program? So implementation planning takes a lot of discussion and understanding. And really, we're looking at all the steps we've went through so far to understand, is there, are we going to do something such as a wide-scale implementation, or are we targeting a specific population of staff? So like I mentioned, referring back to our information sources can help with this decision making. So looking at our injury data, stakeholder feedback, and the resources that we do have available to us. I can't stress enough how important it is to create a plan or a process. This is how we gain buy-in. This is how, for our organization, we've implemented this process now through seven different phases, and we've used the same plan and process every time. And we gain approval to that plan from leadership that we are working with. And then communication, how are we communicating this plan? So be it to your internal team. So for us, we work with three teams in our health, safety and wellness department. How are all of our teams aware of what's going on? Then we're looking at the teams we're working with. So leaders and then the impacted staff, how is the program being communicated to them? So for our example, our implementation flow is outlined here. So we decided we weren't just going to tackle the whole organization. It wasn't practical with 15,000 employees. So we decided we were going to take a two-pronged approach. Organizationally, we went organization-wide with our protocol, resources, standardized curriculums, and the new hire training. Our new hire training was targeted to specific departments and specific occupations. That actually required this based on the role of performing safe patient handling. We then took a targeted approach, focusing on what we call our high injury units. So we strategically chose our top 25 units, reevaluating after every phase of implementation. So we implement um, one site in approximately three to four departments at that site um, based on priority. And every time we've implemented, as I mentioned, we've implemented seven phases now, we go through this outline that you see here. So we always have an initial meeting, we then conduct our needs assessments, which entails also our staff focus groups and action plan generation. We then go through pre-training planning. So this is where our peer coaches are selected, our training logistics are confirmed, and we do a pre-training survey. We then train staff. So that's when we look at training our peer coaches and the remaining staff. 
Then we have post-training follow-up, which looks at a post-training survey as well as impact analysis. And then touching on the sustainability piece that we will get to, we then conduct what we call peer coach unit walks. So we look at challenges and resource availability for our staff. Step five is evaluating your program. So how are you going to evaluate that this is actually successful or if there's changes that need to be made? So really it comes down to outlining what's your evaluation criteria going to be. And for us, when we created that logic model in the beginning, that helped outline for us what we were evaluating. But really, you want to understand what aspects are you trying to influence with your program. So this can be very much directed by your strategic plan of your organization as well. So for us, what we decided and what I would recommend for most is collecting pre-implementation and post-implementation feedback because then you can see what your impact has actually been. So for you, you need to decide how will that data be collected? What are the time intervals for collection? Are there any incentives to complete? Because we know staff love coffee and food. And how will you evaluate the data? For us, the metrics that we collected were fairly simple. We wanted to understand what were our training demographics. So the number of staff that were requiring training versus that that completed the training, so compliance. And our number of peer coaches. What supports do we have to, for sustainability within our departments? Pre and post program implementation injury statistics. So we not only tracked pre injury, our pre uh, implementation, but post our medical aids and lost time injuries to see what the impact has been there. And then finally, we wanted to see what our survey results were telling us. And our survey was very much aligned or directed towards those targets that we had uh, previously outlined in our logic model. So we wanted to understand, was there an improvement in the perceived knowledge of staff for MSD prevention and patient handling? Was confidence increased with using the equipment? What was the perceived accessibility of equipment? And what was the reported compliance of use of safe work practices? With our pilot program, so this was our first phase of launch, we were able to find that 43% um, increase in knowledge of MSD prevention and safe patient handling topics. We also found a 44% increase in perceived confidence using the patient handling equipment. A 34% increase in equipment accessibility was found. This was an extremely interesting finding for our team because at this point, we hadn't actually made any changes to equipment storage or purchase new equipment yet for this department or these departments. So it was just the knowledge that was gained that they perceived equipment was more accessible. We also found a 59% decrease of staff reporting manual lifting of patients from the floor. This was a finding we were not expecting. To date, it's been four years since we've implemented this program and I just ran the statistics last week and we have now sustained a 65% injury reduction in these departments that we initially launched in. Our last step is establishing sustainability. What do I need to consider to sustain my program? So establishing sustainability starts with how you design your program and how you can embed program elements. So really it's thinking about what are those struggle points potentially? How do I ensure that they're not going to happen? So for us, use of the peer coaches, peer coach model was one of those aspects we embedded right into the program development. Communication, slow and steady. And I say this because it takes a long time. So for us, we didn't really see a change outside of our survey results until 18 months post implementation. That's when we actually saw the decrease in injuries start. So when I say slow and steady, the communication means it needs to be constant and consistent, the same message over and over. Visibility. We found it was very effective to be physically visible to staff. It's funny because staff see myself and our trainer monthly and are kind of like, oh, the safe patient handling team is here. They know we're there and why we're there. And I should um, just step back a bit when I talk about embedding into the program elements. Um, I did mention the patient handling unit walks that we do. So what that is, um, is we established into the whole process that monthly we are in the departments reviewing with our peer coaches and staff about 
any challenges they're having, but also providing a quick refresher on topics they have that are of interest. It could either be new products or products they're not as familiar with because they haven't used as frequently with their patient population. And finally, the last part, the review and evaluation piece for sustainability. So always referring back to those information sources. Is there new information available based on our injury information? Is there new literature that potentially we should be course correcting for? And what are our metrics telling us? So again, those injuries, are we still seeing them? Are we not? Are we seeing a new type of injury? And I'll give you an example about this. So when we look at our injuries, we not only see that there are direct injuries related to perhaps uh, mobility was not assessed prior to transfer, but we would see them that it was patient behavior related. So something happened there where the patient was responsive in some way and we now have an injury that resulted in a patient handling piece. So from that, we've now reached out to our departments when we do our needs assessments and ask, are there any supportive uh, programs or training that you are working on, such as um, Gentle persuasive approaches is one program that we use. So is GPA training provided to your staff? So that's been something now where we know we should look for because our injury information has provided that to us. So we now ask departments if they're looking for any training um, in addition to that to support this program. So like I mentioned, um, for our program, our peer coaches, our unit walks, and we also have annual e-learning that we go through for sustainability. With communication and visibility, we also tie this into other initiatives that are ongoing within our groups. So we have site annual reviews, Healthy Workplace Month or Ergonomics Month, so the month of October we try to place even more emphasis on these activities. Department safety huddles, so we've provided questions for staff to use either daily, weekly or monthly depending on how often they meet to chat about different challenges they might be having, tools that are available or different approaches available. And then with our injury investigations, we've actually taken a new approach. Um, we've implemented the CORDI system. And with doing that, what we've done now is we auto-generate emails. As soon as there is an injury that is related to patient handling, there's an auto-generated email that now goes out to leaders that provides them all of the safe patient handling resources available to them to support their investigation and review with staff. And finally, when I, we look at review and evaluation for sustainability, like I mentioned, injury tracking, we also provide leadership reports and updates to various committees across our organization. We've also noted with this that as we move along in this program now, our baseline training is sometimes not enough in the sense that there are new products for new challenges. So we course correct to add those in to our training for staff. So really what I, wanted, what I wanted to get across today for you is that patient handling and creating this program is all about fostering behavior change and that we know it's not just about training. So we need to raise that awareness piece for staff. We need to build those skills. We need to develop those policies and we need to provide supportive environments. I found this little cartoon that I thought was interesting because this is something we hear every single time we deliver training. There's always one person in the room that has experience and has stated, I can't be bothered to change my ways. And really when we deliver this program, our goal is to change that view. And we've been fairly successful in doing that. So I went through the information fairly quickly for you because I can already see some questions generating and I'm sure there's many out there. So I will now pass it back over to Catherine to um, provide any questions and I can answer any of those that you may have. Thank you so much Janice, what an excellent presentation I'm sure everyone has appreciated the details you've provided about the necessary processes for the success of a comprehensive safe handling program. Um, quickly, the injury reports that you have uh, looked at, did you find any correlation between the type of staff and when injuries were happening, for example, new staff or in the evening. Just wondered, this has come up before, and I just wonder if there was any additional information related to that. Um, actually, we, we looked at that in the very beginning when we started this program and we did not find any correlation. And really, 
when we think about injuries on nights, and it's interesting you brought that up because we thought for sure we would see more on nights because there's typically less staff on shift, but actually there's less patient handling activity going on at night because patients for the most part are asleep. So we do see them mostly during day shift. Um, and with age, it, we do have injuries with new hires and we do have injuries with staff that have been here for years. And really there was no correlation with that at all either. Well, I think that's really good news. So I'm going to start by addressing your peer coaching program. Can you elaborate, elaborate a little more about how it works and how many you have, for example, per patient slash employee and what's the turnover rate for these coaches? Yep. So our peer coach program, so essentially they the program works in that these staff are volunteers, some are voluntold, but the majority are volunteers and really they're not meant to train staff or anything like that. They're what I call our cheerleaders. So they're really advocates for the program. They're the one staff they can go to and ask questions. Um, you know, I've, I've had a hard time doing this transfer. Can you help me out? Maybe I did something wrong. Um, they're not paid any more or less. There's nothing different other than they're advocates for our program. Turnover happens. I mean, when we look at our medicine departments, who we did our pilot with, the staff that are there now are not the staff that we initially trained. So it's really staying on top. So I manually track all of our peer coaches, um, but we now have them in our new learning management system too. So we can track where they are and it's following up with leaders on a regular basis being like, you only have one or two coaches left would you consider training some more? So we, we are always focusing on ensuring we have adequate numbers. Um, when it comes to how many we have or how they're assigned, what we try to do is look at the shifts or the teams that are within a department and we say you should have one or two coaches per team and that you should have a representation from all of your occupations, being that RNs, RPNs, allied health, so OTPT, if they have health care aides or PSWs in some organizations, all of these staff should represent your peer coaching team. Thank you. Very, very useful information. A quick question about your e-learning program. Was it developed in-house or purchased? It was developed in-house. So our team um, provides the content to our education team who then supports developing our e-learning. And is that e-learning available outside of Hamilton House Sciences? Not at this time. <laughs> we are currently revamping that program or that e-learning. Um, right now our e-learning it starts general and then you pick a stream. So it could be material handling, patient handling, or office environment. We will be separating them to three separate to better track compliance to completion. Might be something for us to look at down the road to partner in delivering outside of Hamilton Health Sciences. So we can talk more about that at another time. Have you exclusively delivered this in the acute settings or have you branched out to the community and what does peer coaching and equipment procurement look like if you have branched out? So right now it has only been in the acute setting. We have not branched out. That being said, um, we have been able to support um, some equipment in the community in the sense that through the program a lot of our staff are now familiar with equipment they may have never seen before and when it comes to returning the patients to home in some instances um, a product for example like a sitting a sit um, and raising aid so the Sarah study or standing and raising aid sorry correct myself um, staff have seen this and we're like, this is all this patient needs to go home. So we've now been able to work with some of our community resources to acquire that equipment to allow patients to go home. And it's through this program that we've been able to identify that need. So it's not that we've launched the program per se in the community itself, but we've had some impact in the community. That's great. Um, with respect to families and clients, uh, patients, has there been an effort to involve them in any of this work and in the need and use for equipment? So based on liability and risk, we do not support staff, uh, sorry, pa patients' families um, using our equipment in the acute setting. That being said, 
what is done in the home and in the community setting, I'm not sure and I can't speak to, but within our hospital walls, the equipment is only used by our staff. For your patient handling unit walks, how much time do you set aside for this? Is it a set time or you, do you do it just when you can? No, it is a set time. So every month um, we meet. So right now we've launched in 25 departments. So that's 25 unit walks. <laughs> um, and I set aside usually 30 minutes per department. Some sessions, and we've learned that 30 minutes is a lot of time. So depending on the content we're delivering or the refresher required or the challenges being faced, we will reduce the time or increase the time. And when I say that, we'll increase time if staff have reached out to us prior to. So when we schedule them, all our peer coaches receive meeting invites for the date and time so they know we're coming. They share that information with their team, either at their morning huddle or at their team meeting. Then when we're there, we go to our peer coaches to help um, solicit staff for the training or the refresher. Um, but sometimes they reach out to us, for example, with a, they have a patient with bariatric needs and they need support uh, problem solving. So we know going into that situation that we might need some more time to help problem solve and we can bring some ideas with us to support them at that time too. So roughly 30 minutes per department is what we allot per month. Thanks, Janice. And do you have a mandate for a specific number of staff for specific lifts or transfers? And if so, so, is there an issue with compliance when staff are busy or have challenges getting additional support to perform the lift or transfer tasks? That's a great question. Um, yes, so our protocol states a minimum of two staff required for all patient handling tasks using equipment. So that's a minimum. After that, it's with clinical judgment. So I'll use an example in the ICU. You have a patient who has many lines and tubes just to manage those lines and tubes, regardless of the transfer, you may need one or two staff. So a transfer there may require four staff to perform, but that's not every situation. So we have the minimum of two, and from there it's at clinical judgment. We do have staff though that like to perform tasks on their own, um, which again, when it comes to injury investigation time, that's a question, did you have help? It's part of our needs assessment when we ask questions, how do staff ask for help? And a lot of our staff now perform what's called pairs care. So they will go into, depart into a patient's room, two staff at a time to perform care and to perform transfers. So we do have that two staff minimum. That's great. And how often do the coaches have coaching shifts or come together? So our coaches work no additional shifts outside of their own. So there's no such thing as a coaching shift. They just work their regular shifts and support um, staff who have questions on their shift. We did find and we do struggle with bringing our peer coaches together though. And this was something that they shared with us. And um, what we did last year is we hosted our first safe patient handling conference. And that was a time where our peer coaches were invited and we sat down, we brought in some presenters internally and externally, but it was a time for them to meet, to share um, challenges, questions, concerns, and that's kind of how we've approached that. So because we have five different hospitals, um, three of which are our dominant sites for the program, there's many coaches that will never see each other outside of that avenue. So we, we've now developed that and we have our next conference planned for May of 2020. Now, who are involved in the planning and implementing of the program? Is it just the occupational and health, health and safety staff or nursing department? So when we sit down to implement the program, it would be our health safety and wellness team. So typically an ergonomist um, with our manager. It will be the department's manager, sometimes director, it would also include their educator, um, nursing representation. Um, it also then, and we typically have found the allied health team, so OT or PT are typically involved at that point, just to get the conversation started. Then when we get to the needs assessment, multiple parties are brought in pending on the 
who is responsible for what in the department. So it does vary, but we have our staples, be it that department leadership with nursing and allied health representation are present with the health safety and wellness team. And just on that, with the implementation, in your timeline, for all the work up to getting the program off the ground, how long before implementation? So when we started this in 2015, <laughs> it was kind of a quick one. I started in June and we launched in October. So that's what, three or four months um, to develop the entire program. When we implement, so um, when we look at our initial meeting to kind of developing all the training logistics, the pre-planning and whatnot, that usually takes two months to get ready and prepared, securing training space, all of that piece. Training usually takes three months, we allot typically for training. So right now we're in a phase which we started in September and it'll end in the beginning of December. And then we start, um, within a few weeks of training ending, we start our uh, sustainability or post implementation follow-up. So that's when we start our unit walks and whatnot. So the whole thing when you think about developing an entire program or just implementing um, a piece of the program, it could take up to half a year just to get the program developed and then implemented into a few departments. Okay, thank you. That certainly makes a lot of sense. Just going back to the question around families, we've got some clarification that it wasn't so much about family members using the equipment. It was more about Family members often are opposed to their loved ones being moved in a lift. Sometimes patients don't want to be moved. Is there an effort to communicate the safe handling policy and practices to family members and patients so they understand why it's important and sometimes non-negotiable? Yes, I haven't personally had to deal with this myself, but I know there have been a few departments where this has come up. and. The department manager has taken that on in communicating with the family and stating it's for staff safety. I haven't heard much more about it other than that, that the communication has happened and the equipment is used. So we haven't had too much experience with that. Okay. Uh, can you comment on how you handled scope creep? So when creating the program, how did you deal with so much information and get it down to such a focused delivery method? Um, the injuries really helped dictate that, to be honest. When we looked at the types of injuries we were having, having um, the equipment we had available, identifying gaps in that equipment based on the injuries we were having, that's kind of how we narrowed down what we were going to focus on in regards to the curriculum that we train. There is a lot of information and um, it really was also with the focus groups and staff feedback. I think that is what really gave us the greatest insight into what challenges staff were facing and what they really needed as a baseline. And scope creep, it, it, it's there, don't get me wrong. There are some things that I get questions on that we really don't have anything to do with, but we're there now and we're available, so we get the questions. Um, but I think it's just knowing what did you, what are you setting out to do and how are you going to achieve it and understanding what will and will not impact that. So I'm not sure if that really helped answer that question, but the staff feedback for us was really important. Understanding what equipment they would use and wouldn't use and why they wouldn't use it really helped us focus on what we wanted to train on. Okay, thank you. And important question related to the HR challenges in the, in the overall hospital and healthcare setting. Did you get any pushback about the two-person minimum? How did you address inadequate staffing issues in order to adopt this? <laughs> I laugh because we still have this issue. So we've not had pushback per se in that they don't want to do it. Staff don't want to staff. We received more pushback in that whole comment about the inadequate staffing issues. I think every single survey we have done, staffing issues has come back as the number one concern and challenge. And there's some teams that are better than others at finding help and working together. And there's some technologies that help now too with that. So the Vocera, um, it's like a walkie talkie concept or a cell phone for work. Um, so there's some departments that have started to use the Vocera and then they just speak into it and someone comes. But there's times that doesn't happen and depending on the needs of the patients, 
we do still see one staff member boosting or turning. Um, so yeah, that is definitely a challenge and that's one of those issues that we're not easily able to address, but we do definitely know that staffing is an issue. Okay, and I'm going to go back to the training, Janice. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you think it's worth elaborating on rationale for a smaller group size as it pertains to hands-on training. Do you have any thoughts around this and group size for training? Yes, most definitely. Um, so we cap our hands-on training to six staff, and we do that to maximize the amount of time staff uh, have hands-on time with the equipment. We find that the training is most effective when staff are actually playing with it and even having the experience of being in it. So in all of our training, um, we've capped it at six. There are some, obviously, scenarios where we have seven or eight staff, but six, it, we found, was the most ideal for that hands-on time. And staff really appreciate being in the equipment to get that experience that the patient has. So how does it feel to be in a ceiling lift? How does it feel to have the sling in a certain position um, when you're sitting in your ceiling lift? We get that comment all the time. Or our roll board transfers, when they pull and they see how fast it actually feels, um, they're like, oh, I will be doing this a little differently now. So getting that, that piece is really, really important, not only for our staff, but for our patients as well. One of the organizations is struggling to get staff involved in the peer coaching as there's always a push for paid time to complete outside duties. Did you struggle with this and how did you handle that? So when we look for our coaches, a lot of them are volunteers and a lot of them and no one is paid extra time. There is all done during the regular shifts, and then we're not asking them to perform any duties outside of their regular scope of work. So really, if a staff member were to ask them a question about an IV, it'd be no different now if a staff member asked them a question about a patient handling concern. So that's kind of the mentality we went in with, that we're not expecting them to do anything outside of the norm, except to be that advocate. So when a patient falls to the floor, and when that happens, it's unfortunate, but we need to understand the patient's not falling any further. As long as they're safe and comfortable, take the time, get the lift, and get them up. And that's really what the coach is doing, ensuring that happens. So they're saying, you know what, wait a minute, you go get the lift, you grab the slider sheets, you do this, and they're helping direct that situation. So really, we're not asking them to do any more than they normally would for any other clinical situation within their scope. Okay. How long is the hands-on training and how many people are on your team? So the hands-on training piece for new hires, it's three hours. And for current staff, it's four, only because we include the theory component with it. Um, and there's three ergonomists on our staff here at HHS. Okay. Um, we do have a question about how you manage the bariatric patient handling training. I'll let you briefly answer that because we... We've done a whole webinar on that. Yeah. Um, we, for our program specifically, we tackle the bariatric patient handling training piece specifically for peer coaches. And there'll be more to come on that actually with our bariatric best practice committee. So I'm not going to go too much more in detail on that piece. Okay. And we do have on our website, for those of you who are interested, um, a previous presentation from the client patient community of uh, practice on our bariatric clients and safe patient handling. How many new employee orientation sessions do you provide each month on average? We currently have nine sessions per month and are expanding to 10 in the new year because every single session is full for about two to three months in advance. Okay, so had lots of accolades and thanks and based on your results for injury avoidance we have uh, somebody encouraging you and your team to push for a super numerary coaching shifts backfilling um, or a regular shift so they can spend their entire coaching shifts coaching staff without having to look at their own patient caseloads. Uh, this comes from, I believe, outside of Ontario, and their health uh, authority has embraced that approach. 
No, that's awesome. And I, I know there's some organizations within Ontario that use that approach for staff. Um, I'm not sure if they're paid for it, but I know they do the training and whatnot. We decided for our organization that we would just keep the coaches as advocates for the program only. So we've got a nurse consultant educator, and her goal is to present, um, or his goal is to present a similar program to various healthcare settings. Any advice on how they can approach nursing home hospitals to start such programs? Every situation is different, so I don't know if there's going to be a cookie cutter approach to this. I think it's having a conversation. And to be honest, this program has been successful because of the relationships that have been built. So as much as it is about everything I've talked with, the equipment and the training and the needs assessments and whatnot, we've built relationships with these departments and with these staff that there now is a comfort to use the safe work practices. And don't get me wrong, we're not perfect. There are still struggles and there are still challenges, but they know they have somewhere they can go for help and for questions. So my suggestion is see who you want to approach and have a conversation. Ask them what their challenges and struggles are and know what you, what you have that you can provide them to help them out. Um, I think we have time for two more questions. One being who hosts your new employee orientation? So we do. So the site ergonomists um, support the orientation. We have training rooms at each of our main hospital locations, so dedicated space with dedicated equipment to provide the training. So the nine soon coming 10 sessions a month we do are at those sites and trained by our ergonomists. You mentioned uh, other training and you, you gave an example of GPA training, gentle persuasive approaches. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. Is this something you look at to support staff in client-patient handling? Are there certain other trainings you would recommend? Or is it a function of the type of clients people on a certain unit are working with? A lot of times it will depend on the patient population, but as we look at the injuries, we do still see a lot, they get tied and mixed together, um, patient behaviors with patient handling. When, when you're handling a patient, you're in their personal space, and that could be a trigger for many patients and the behaviors they display. So really, I think it's important, and it's what we've been seeing and communicating, that either if it's GPA, CPI, any of these de-escalation type um, programs, they tie in nicely hand-in-hand -hand with your patient handling program because these are unexpected situations a lot of the times. And if there is a behavior or if there is something going on, it may not be the best time to even approach or to perform a patient handling task. So we really think it's important that staff have both. Um, it's never a, a must do for us. It's more of a recommendation. Have you considered this? And we leave it to the department to make that decision. Wonderful. Great advice. Well, I want to thank you so much. And I'd um, like to thank our participants. Tons of questions. Uh, I'm sure we'll be looking at a follow-up webinar to flesh out some more details because we've just had so many questions and so much support for this presentation. So thank you so much, Janice. And I'd like to remind all of our participants that you will get a copy of Janice's presentation tomorrow along with an evaluation that we would really appreciate you filling out. I encourage all of you to check the CREE-MSD events page. We do have a free lecture coming up on Monday, October 21st at the University of Waterloo on adverse outcomes associated with occupational exposures to whole body vibration, making a health and safety business case. I do encourage any of you who are in the neighborhood to please join us for that free lecture and as well we have some great resources including some resources that Janice has referenced in the development of their program on the msdprevention.com website so please also check out that website thank you so much everyone and we look forward to speaking with you again in the near future bye bye